conference today for a number of reasons. One is to announce that we are going to march again on the south side this evening. We're going to begin here at the Freedom House at 6 o'clock. And we're going to take the same route that we took last night. We're going to cross the Mason-Dixon line at the 16th Street Vidoc, down the Lincoln Avenue, and again to Kajesco Park. The Fair Housing Marches were uh, uh, designed to push for uh, fair housing law in Milwaukee prior to um, the time of the passage of the Fair Housing Law, it, National Fair Housing Law in 1968. It was legal to tell people that you would not rent to them because they were black. Um, in fact, the whole housing policy of the United States discriminated against African Americans and other people of color. As a kid, I marched with uh, Father Graf. Uh We would meet regularly in the 60s at St. Boniface Church. And I didn't know as much as I know now. But it said, come on. It pretty much went like this. It said, come on, we're getting ready to march across the bridge for fair housing. So kids like, what is fair housing? We want equality. We want better housing. And we don't want to be redlined or restricted on where we can move. And then they said we have a problem with the banking system because they won't give us banking loans to purchase houses. And we got our money, we're outstanding citizens, we, we meet all the qualifications, but they won't give us the money. Or they're saying we don't want you, these are white people, we don't want you niggas, this is how they talk, niggas in our neighborhood. Go back to Africa. In the meantime, um, Alder Val Phillips had been advocating for a fair housing law because she wanted to be able to move to a nice house in a neighborhood with good schools. She was a lawyer, married to a lawyer, they had money. So the whole argument about if you had money you could move anywhere collapses in view of their reality. That first night there were maybe 200 of us from the Youth Council who headed toward the 16th Street Viaduct. Another 50 people from the South Side came to join the march. When we got to the South Side, there were throngs, crowds, mobs of people. Uh, the police estimate five to 8,000 counter demonstrators, 50 in all. Because they just march with us every night, the police. Although they did do their little, um, uh, uh, shenanigans with us. They would put tape across their badges so we couldn't identify them to report any actions they did. I don't know what it was, but they had to have them to ha take that off of them because they were getting complaints, you know, from us about, well, who did it? I don't know. Which officer? I don't know. He got tape on his badge. Couldn't get his number. The thing that I remember most clearly is being in Kosciuszko Park, which was the um, destination of that first and the second march was a police officer coming up to us and saying to Father Graffi, Father, would you say your prayer or whatever it is you want to do here and then let's get out because we can't hold them. Uh, so by police admission, the counter demonstrators, so-called, were out of control. Well, for crossing the, the bridge thing, they threw everything at us, everything. Obscenities, objects, um, bottles, rocks, bricks, um, spit, <laughs> feces, you name it, they threw it at us. Mm -hmm. If there's a gap between the commandos and us, they would get in and, in and out, get in and out. It was, yeah, bricks and bats and everything. I remember hearing incidents where they were getting stoned, like rocks stoned at them. We were extremely concerned about what happened on the south side last night because you see what you had there was a white riot. There was a riot on the south side. When we had a, a so-called riot here in the city of Milwaukee, which wasn't a riot, it was merely a disturbance, Mayor Meyer called in the National Guard and put the entire city under a curfew. Now, last night you had a riot on the south side, but the mayor has not called in the National Guard. Now we nearly got killed there last night, and those of you that were with us last night know that especially coming out of that park. What we are asking is that the mayor give us the same protection that he 
so-called gave the white businessmen here in the core when we had a disturbance a number of weeks ago. The next day, a bunch of our parents came out also because they found out what happened to us the night before. We had a crowd that had to be dispersed with tear gas uh, from the National Guard. And are you talking about hostile? It was a big deal. This was the night before the big bridge crossing. So our parents came out with us, got on the phone and called all the other parents and everything. Our children have been through it. You know, it's getting rough for them now. You shoot tear gas into the air and it goes whichever way the wind is going. We were so full of tear gas where we had to get undressed in the hallways because it was still on our clothes and bringing it to our other young people in the house. It was a mess. <laughs> and so they sympathized with us and like, okay, our children are out there, they're being chaperoned and they're being protected with the commandos and, you know, everything like that. But it's time for us to step in and help the children. My uncles, my aunts, my mother, my father. My father never washed. <laughs> you know, he had, he um he worked every day, so he had to. He, he stayed home, but that one night he came out, I was so surprised and happy. He did a couple of rescues that night also. We got back to St. Boniface, and the um the uh, police in riot gear still wanted to disperse us. And so they had us all, we all went on the parade ground, all bunched together, and they threw tear gas canister. And my, my sister has asthma real bad, and she f fell out, but before he could catch her, he took the canister and threw it back on the police. <laughs> One of the canisters anyway, so. With my mother in the middle, me and my sister on either side of her, and all the other people. And I can remember looking, and, and I can remember the fear. But at the same time, I can remember the pride that we had coming across trying to make a statement. So I think that's another good thing with the people nowadays, that they see these young people standing up and marching, not just for us, but for you know the generations to come, because this has the, the racial bias and the injustice. It all has to stop at some point. And when people take action, things get done. Uh, but it turned cold, it turned snowy. This is the year of the Packer Ice Bowl. We were marching. We're going to exercise our constitutional right to picket and to protest. Uh, we have tried every means possible to bring fair housing legislation to the city of Milwaukee. And we're going to continue the march. It's up to the government of this city and of this state to see to it that we can exercise our constitutional right of freedom of speech. And we're going to exercise that, regardless of what the danger. We'll die for that right. Martin Luther King was killed on April 4th. April 10th, Congress passed a civil rights bill. And people say, don't be violent. Be nonviolent. But we had 200 nights of nonviolent marches and got nowhere. The rioting, the violence after the death of Martin Luther King, and boom, there's your law. You can stand there and philosophize, posture, pose, and quote all this magnificent stuff, but what in the hell are you doing? See, the measure of a man or woman ain't, is not what you say, is what you do. The mayor of Wauwatosa at the time asked the governor, Warren Knowles, a Republican at the time, to send up, to call up the National Guard, which they did. And the point was to protect the marchers. And so they did protect the marchers. Here we were in a line, and alongside of us were National Guard's men. They were all men. So that if somebody wanted to attack us, they had to first get through the National Guard. Packing the marches, lining up and pushing back on the marchers says that you think all those marchers are guilty, which they are not. Racial tension to me is, that's a scary thing, especially when you got children you bring it up. And to think now, 40, 50 years later, they still gotta be worried about what they say and how they act around certain people, that's not good. <laughs>
to me, now that I'm older, I appreciate my mother being nonviolent about it because to me that makes more of a statement. Never doubt that the good that you do continues to do its work in the world. Keep on going because if you stop, nobody will ever hear or ever know. I encourage everyone 100% to keep on. This stuff works. Standing up, speaking up, whether it's with laws, legislation, whatever, the whole, the whole thing, it works only if you get up and fight, stand up, and try and make a difference, try and make a change. Do not take a step back. Hold your ground and keep pushing forward in unity. Never stoop, never stoop to the low level that your enemy does. Just persevere, do it peacefully if you can, but just don't lay down and, and take the abuse and the, um, everything. Use the court system, um, stay behind the issues at hand, and uh, just don't give up because you can't. Let's put up a good fight. That's what makes people notice us. And so I just want to encourage everybody to keep on keeping on because today is a new day that we never saw before. And if it's a new day, then that means there's new opportunities. Keep on pushing.